Thank you, Brother Hanson. I appreciate this, man. I have the privilege of speaking a number of times at the Fairfax Baptist Temple in Fairfax, Virginia. Dr. Bud Calvert is the founder of that church. Uh, by the way, uh, I'll tell you two quick things about that. Number one, Bud Calvert was an unsaved man who was a paratrooper and was on his way home from getting out of the military. He stopped at a gas station to use the restroom. And somebody had left a gospel track on the tank of the commode. He picked it up, took it with him, read that track, and he got saved. Fairfax Baptist Temple at one time was supporting 500 missionaries a month at over $100 a month. I was speaking for him, and I said, I always like to ask about staff, I said, who's the best staff member you ever had? He said, no question, no question. This man right here, Gil Hansen. I said, really? He then told me how he'd been a commander of a ship. He actually put off starting the school for a year till he got off his last tour of duty. I said, what made him such a great staff member? Because like most of you, I have always been in a second position. I've never been the senior pastor. He says, Dr. R, let me tell you one story. He goes, whenever I'd ask him to do something, he'd always respond right away, great lesson. But he'd always sign his notes, YTC. He goes, I was in the Navy. He goes, I didn't know what that meant. So finally, I went and asked Brother Hanson what YTC stood for. He goes, that's a military term. Yours to command. So Brother Hanson, who is older than Dr. Calvert, said, I'm yours to command. My pastor's five years younger than I am. I'm 64, he's 59. I'm his to command. And that was a great lesson he taught me. Uh, by the way, he served there at Fairfax. He was a principal for 26, 26 years as a principal there at an amazing Christian school. And uh, he's the one who was the founder, built it under Brother Calvert. So now, I really believe this is the most important thing that I'm going to share with you while I'm here. I've titled this Renters or Owners. Renters or Owners. Are you a renter or are you an owner? I don't know. You probably know. I don't know the answer. I don't think, I think we just have these. Oh, we have a hand up for that too? Great, hand them out. I didn't know I had a hand up for that. That's wonderful. If you have your Bibles, whether give this hand up, please turn with me, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter number 21. I just wrote this this summer, about in August. I knew I was coming up here. Brother Jake has been a friend, and I've been up here two or three times before, and I couldn't remember everything I spoke of before, so we have all new things for you this time. And uh, other than one thing I'm going to share with the, uh, maybe the very last session, but uh, it's all new stuff. And after I wrote this, I said, I really believe this is super, super important. And so I shared this with our college staff. I shared this with our school staff. And uh, I also share this at my home church uh, in a message because I've got two ways to handle this. Are you a renter and owner in your church or are you a renter or owner in your school? And obviously this will deal with the school situation. And before we share with you right now, I want you to ask yourself a question. Where I serve, am I a renter or am I an owner? And there's a big difference. I am a landlord. I don't have social security. I don't have an IRA, but I have some rental houses. I bought some after the market crashed. They're really good houses. I paid 54,000 for one, 56 for the other, 57 for the other, and I have one other home. I've never lived in those homes, but I've had renters in those homes. I could tell you very, very, very clearly today that renters take care of their home differently than an owner does. Look at our text, if you will. Does anyone not have the handout sheet? Anybody not have it? Thank you, men, for helping me. Tim, thank you. I didn't even know I had a hand up for that. 1 Kings 21, look at verses 1 through 3. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Let's pray. Lord, I, I ask for your help in these next minutes. I pray that this will be a help, a blessing, and an encouragement. 
Lord Jesus, I believe this is truly what you want to share here at this conference. I pray you'll be glorified. I pray that this will give us pause to think. And I pray that for having been here in this opening session, we'll be a little bit closer to being the owners of the task you have given us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And preacher, I wrote this down for every other session. What time am I supposed to be done with this one here? I'm sorry? 9.45. Okay, we can do it. I have some pictures I'd like to show you. This picture was taken very close to here. I was speaking up here in Everett or in Linwood, and I, I was staying in a Staybridge suite. I stay in hotels a lot. I've stayed in Marriott hotels in my lifetime over 1,100 nights. I'm titanium elite for life. I'm, I'm way up there with Hilton. I'm up there with Holiday Inn because I'm on the road a lot. Staybridge Suites is the top of the IHG or the Holiday Inn chain. It's a good place to stay. Very, very nice. I went for a walk with my wife in the morning. We walked back and this was sitting on the sidewalk. Someone had enjoyed their yogurt, had their cigarette, and they left it there. That is a renter and not an owner. Next picture. That's baseboard in the house. Next picture. That's the screen door of the same house. Next picture. That's the master bedroom door. Obviously, there was a dog involved here of the same house. Next picture. That's the drywall that they kicked in in the same house. Next picture. That is, thank, who said that, not good? I use that phrase, not good. <laughs> Should we say this is an uninvited guest? I never saw a roach in my life growing up in Southern California. I went to Bob Jones University where it was hot and humid. We had a guy on graves of the third floor who collected them in a jar. Not good. Uh, let, let's go back to that last picture. I, I've had a, a a young lady who for 15 years has worked in our ministry and she puts things together for messages for me. She'll get, you know, I'll send her things. She'll help me find some illustrations once in a while. I'll send her the lesson, the verses, and send them to her. I sent her these pictures. She said, did somebody make you stay in that house? I said, no. That's a house I own. Renter stayed there. I went back to that house, replaced two ceiling fans, replaced two screen doors, painted a lot of things, had to tear out a piece of carpet, replace that carpet. A renter and not an owner. Let me give you some biblical illustrations of owners. The first of these is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul owned the responsibility of sharing the gospel. There's someone in this room today, I will not mention him, who told me this year he's led nine young people in his class to Christ. That was a blessing to my heart. Every teacher needs to at least own the salvation of the children that have been entrusted to the watch care in their class for this year. By the way, you have the greatest open door to their homes. Every parent wants a teacher to come, I'd like to get to know you better. I'd like you to tell me how you can help your child better. And by the way, what a great time to find out if the parents are saved. What a great opportunity. By the way, even during COVID, say, I'll wear a mask. The Apostle Paul owned the responsibility of sharing the gospel. It was his calling, it was his duty. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. He labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and day have I been in the deep. But he still owned his mission. He owned it. He didn't let those things stop him. You say, you don't know what they said about me. <laughs> I've always said, tell the parents, I won't believe what they say about you if you don't believe what they say about me, right? <laughs> I went to Pastor Chapel last year. I said, I've been lied about twice in six months. 
He goes, ha, 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 Dr. R. He goes, I get lied about every week. Probably true. Realist, I mean, I've read things said about our ministry that are so far beyond the pale that it's almost inconsequential. They don't have bus ministry. What are all those yellow buses doing out there? What girls wear at our college? What Bible we use? I mean, written in magazines. Just absolutely fallacious. What pastors have said. Some that I formerly taught. He says, let it go. Because the Bible does say, blessed are you when men shall persecute you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. Paul lived that. And God used him mightily. I'm teaching a class this semester, Lives of Great Missionaries. I'll tell you who I started with, the Apostle Paul. Greatest missionary church planter who ever lived. Secondly, let's look at Naboth who owned a vineyard. <laughs> I love this story. Obviously, when you want to have the picture in the dictionary of bad king, bad queen, without a doubt, it's Ahab and his wicked wife. Ahab wanted his vineyard. It was close by the palace. He said, I will give thee the worth of it in money. He owned a vineyard next to Ahab's vineyard. We'll just combine the two. He was offered a better vineyard. He was offered more money for it. He said, no. He said, this is the vineyard that my father has given me. By the way, where you are at is the task that God has given you. The place where God has placed you. And be very careful. Be very, very careful about looking over the fence where the grass seems to be greener. In the words of the great Irma Bombeck, the grass is always greener over the septic tank. <laughs> Secondly, if your grass isn't that green, water it. I love the theme of Chick-fil-A, make it better. How are you making your place better? How is your class better this year than last year? So Naboth said no. He said, it's my vineyard. My father gave it to me, I want to give it to my children. How are you making this, your place of ministry, better for the next generation? By the way, he died because he would not give ownership up of his vineyard. Ahab killed him. Wow. That's an owner and not a renter. Thirdly, we have Nehemiah, and I'm going to concentrate on this. I want to dwell on his life. What an amazing story of an owner and not a renter. Can I say this? The people of Jerusalem, in my opinion, were renters. The walls were broken down. You said, que sera, sera, that famous Christian hymn. <laughs> you have to be older like me to get that. Whatever will be, will be. We have had some interesting times in our home in the last several weeks. We had a slab leak in our kitchen. The water started coming out from under the dishwasher. I went outside, it was coming out between the house and the, and the slab. I go, this is not good. I found out, I did not know this, that well, my home insurance will pay for the repairs of the tile and stuff, they don't pay for the plumber. He had to go through the slab in five places to find the leak. I said, how could it take you five times to jackhammer through the slab? He's a Spanish gentleman, which is Dr. Rasmussen. He goes, there's water everywhere down there. And he was within six or seven feet until he finally found it. His bill was $2,100. Not good. <laughs> Thank you. We get it fixed, finally get it put back together, had to replace the tile in the kitchenette, tile, 330 square feet of tile. In the laundry room, all that had been ruined. New baseboard, new whatever's down by the baseboard, the little round molding. Finally finished. A week ago Saturday, my wife said, sweetheart, something is wrong. I was having my devotions, I said, what is it? She said, the kitchen floor is hot. The kitchen floor has never been hot before. We had another slab leak, now the hot water pipe had broken. So I said, forget it. We moved all our pipes up into the attic, put all new pipe in, $10,500, not covered by insurance. Unbelievable. They're still not finished, which is why I'm glad to be here. 
The piping all works. We have hot water. Didn't have water for a week. I took showers at the gym at school. I took showers at Hudson Hall. It was, it was a, my wife was going to her sister's house to take showers. We had water, but not hot water. Now all the holes are patched. I think 16 holes in the walls, holes in tile, holes in stucco. It's unbelievable. But of course I fixed it. I'm the owner. By the way, my wife's first response, we need to sell the house. <laughs> I said, no, no, we're not going to do that, you know. She said, maybe it's time to sell the house. No, I'm an owner. The people in Jerusalem said, nah, the walls are broken down. We're defenseless. The foxes could come and go. The enemy could come in. But not Nehemiah. He heard about it. Let's look and see what an owner does. The man who owned this city. That's a picture of Jerusalem if you're not familiar with that. This is 500 years before the time of Christ. First of all, he became aware of the need. Aware of the need. Nehemiah 1.3. And they said to me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. The gates are burned with fire. What was his response when something was wrong? By the way, what's your response if something's wrong at your school? If something needs painted, do you paint it? You find a way to get it done. Look at verse Nehemiah 1.4. Nehemiah, it says, and it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted. By the way, the Bible says certain things come out only by fasting and prayer. Do you pray regularly for your school? Do you pray regularly for your students? I write three or 4,000 postcards a year. I wrote every student in our college last summer. An individual handwritten postcard said, I'm praying for you. I pray you'll walk with God and work for God. I wrote every student in our college last Christmas time. We had a longer Christmas because of COVID. I want to know someone's praying for. Everyone who I have, have in my classes, we have terms, seven-week terms. First day of class, I, get a, I give a three-by-five card. I said, give me three prayer requests. I promise you I'll pray for them. I put it in a notebook. I put their picture on one side. It helps me to get to know them with their prayer requests on the other side. After I prayed for I read, I prayed for this personal request. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not real until it's personal. Jerusalem was personal to Nehemiah. It's been said that compassion has carried someone else's hurt on our heart. He didn't live there, but it bothered him. He prayed, fasted, he wept certain days. That's an owner. By the way, he didn't just pray and weep and fast. He did something about it. What will we do? Show our ownership, the place where God's given us. Moving on quickly. Letter C, he prayed fast about the need. Letter D, he enlisted others to help with the need. He enlisted others to help with the need. He went to the king, first of all. Chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 18. I said to the king, if it please the king, if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me into Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. That I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. As also the king's words, which he had spoken to me, verse 18, they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. He got others to help. You might write down next to this, many hands make the burden light. Teachers, how many of you remember going on field trips when you were in school growing up? How many of you remember that? Many, many of you. I did. We went to a science museum. We went to La Brea Tar Pits. How many of you have had a field trip this year? One person. I'm going to tell you why. It's a lot of work. You've got to enlist parents to help. You probably have to get forms filled out. But I believe an owner will do that. They won't probably remember what you taught them, but they will remember what you do with them. They'll remember what you did for them. I taught a ninth and 10th boys Sunday school, ninth and 10th grade boys Sunday school class for 10 years. And I didn't do as much as I should have, but every year in the fall, I would take him to a health food restaurant called Shakey's, bunch of lunch for pizza. 
a pizza buffet. It was on Indianapolis Boulevard. All they could eat. When they go to our house to watch football, that church gathered people from a wide area, probably a 30, 40 mile area. They play football, let them get cleaned up, I take it back to church. In the spring, they come to our house. My wife would make homemade tacos, all the tacos they could eat. Then she'd make these big chocolate chip cookies. We'd make chocolate chip and ice cream sandwiches. I only did two activities a year. Lancaster Baptist Church, that wouldn't work. Brother Jake, with every Sunday school teacher at Lancaster Baptist, has had to have eight activities a year. Because we want our teachers to be owners. I teach, I'm gone four months a year, and we still try to have four or five activities a year with our class. I've heard from students 25 years later, I remember all the activities you used to have. It was two a year. It was two a year. I'm 64, I remember field trips certain teachers took me on. I remember the teachers who stayed after school to help tutor me in algebra, knowing I had zero hope of ever being an engineer. <laughs> I did so well in algebra, I got to come back and be a leader of the class the next year. <laughs> By the way, that teacher, who my dad led to Christ on the 14th visit to his home, the 14th visit, David, who became the chairman of the Board of Deacons, who became my youth pastor, who taught math and science at Faith Baptist Schools for over 30 years. I wrote him about two weeks ago. I said, thank you for investing in my life. He's retired to Wisconsin now. I sent him a Starbucks gift card. I said, I'm always indebted. By the way, remember people who helped you. Proverbs 27, 10, thy own friend of thy father's friends, forsake not. My mentor in college is down in a memory care facility. I'd written him every month for over 30 years. I'm indebted to him. I still write him. He now just says, pretty picture on the postcard. But I'm indebted to him. I want to be an owner of that relationship. Maybe it's a former pastor, a youth pastor, etc. So in Nehemiah, he saw the need and took the lead. He didn't just say, not my job. And by the way, two phrases I hate, not my job and good enough. If we work in a ministry, it's all our job. Brother Hicks, over here, is the pastor, he's been here, is it 13 years, pastor? 13 years here. Brother Hicks was helping with the water leaks yesterday. I don't know him well, I met him when I was here four years ago, I believe. That was servant leadership. That's how it works. That's how it works. So we see that he listened to the help of others, Letter E, this is so important. He overcame opposition. I was preaching in Pennsylvania a few years ago, and a man walked up to me whose staff, he's a graduate West Coast, he was on our staff at the time, he's not anymore, he's a pastor now. And he says, Dr. R, there's so much pressure on my son. And there was a lot of pressure on his son. He was valedictorian of his class, he was very gifted in a lot of different areas. Uh, I said, sir, pressure turns coal into diamonds. Pressure's not a bad thing. Man, just, they're rubbing me the wrong way. Iron sharp as iron, even so man the countenance of his friend. Can I challenge you to realize that as a leader, as an owner, we're going to have to overcome opposition? Sandballot, Tobiah, and Gershom are not people we name our children after. <laughs> Hello, Captain Obvious, right? First they laughed at him, then they tried to attack him. Yep. Oh, by the way, of course they tried to get him to compromise, come down to the plane of Ono. Oh, and I won't use the tried and tired joke, and he said, oh no. Okay, moving on. Letter F, he led others to help him take care of the need. He led others to take care of to care of the need. The walls and gates were replaced in 52 days. Unbelievable. I've been to Jerusalem, that's an amazing thing. I know the size of the old city, that's an amazing thing. They were building and battling. How are you helping to build the school? How involved are you? I met one young lady here who went to school in Indiana, right back here. And uh, that school was famous for their candy sales. All right. When your school does a fundraiser, how involved are you? Because many hands make the burden light. What if everybody got involved? Well, Miss so and so in fourth grade, her class always wins the prize. Do the best you can. 
Do the best you can. So how can you be owners in your school? We've got 15 minutes. We're going to move quickly here. Number, number one, listen to and follow the God-ordained leader. Listen to and follow the God-ordained leader. Obey those that have the rule of you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your soul as they that must give an account. And by the way, if you don't like something in the way it's being done, quietly leave. It's a ministry God has given them. You're there to help them. Don't criticize them. Don't gripe. Don't complain. If you can't stay, you don't feel comfortable, quietly leave. Quietly leave. I resigned from one place over convictions. I didn't throw bombs over my shoulders as I left. Just quietly leave. Follow the leader. I grew up in a pastor's home. I went on recruiting trips to Bob Jones University with my mom and dad as they looked to recruit, recruit teachers. They looked for certain things. They wanted people, number one, to have a heart for God, number two, to have character, and number three, to be soul conscious. By the way, those are three things that every Christian worker ought to be. Have a heart for God, have character, that's being on time, do what you're asked to do, be in your place. The lady who sang last night was a beautiful song, beautiful soprano voice. I can't sing. My wife sings, all three of my kids sing. That's not my place. We all have our place, we need to be in our place. But follow the leader. Lift up the arms of the leader. In Exodus 17, here's a four point outline in the message I preach. Aaron and her, you know the story. Israel was in a battle, Joshua was down leading the army. Aaron was going up the top of the mountain. Moses was going up, Aaron and her went with him. Here's four steps, if you're gonna help the leader. Set out for the top of the leader. Set out for the top. It's an uphill journey. It's harder going uphill than it is going downhill. We all know that. Number two, stay up the hands of the leader. Hold up his hands. Brother Jeff, can you come here for just a second? I'll use you for an illustration. Come on up here for a second. Let's say that Jeff is my leader. Number one, I'm now in trouble. No, I'm just kidding. Come on up here for a second. All right. That was a great skit yesterday, wasn't it? Right now, I, am clo- I have long arms. My sleeve length is 37 inches. My inseam is only 32. I'm built very similar to an orangutan. Okay, so <laughs> I am close enough to touch Brother Jeff right now. I can just touch him. But I'm not close enough to support him. If Aaron and her were like this with Moses, they couldn't hold up his arms. They had to hold up his hands all day long because when his hands were up, they were going forward. When his hands were down, Israel was retreating. So if I'm going to hold up his hands all day, I'm going to have to get in here. I'm going to have to get close to him. I'm going to be able to hold him like this for a while. My arms get tight. I have to hold him like this for a while. I might have to hold him like this for a while. By the way, when you're this close, you might notice some imperfections. Like that little hair growing out of his ear. Just kidding, just kidding, all right? They were in the desert, the Sinai Desert. How good do you think he's going to smell after eight hours in the sun? But you've got to be close to stay up his hands. When was the last time you wrote your pastor a note and said you're praying for him? I text my pastor every Saturday and say, I'm praying for your messages tomorrow. By the way, elevate accountability, eliminate doubt. I'll say it again. Elevate accountability, eliminate doubt. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. So they set out for the top. They stayed up his hands. Thirdly, they set out a stone. This is interesting. The stone was big enough for Moses to sit on. It'd be easier to do that. Probably easier for them to hold up his hands as well. I don't think they went up to the top of the mountain with trenching tools. They probably had a stave. Can you see them over there digging around a big rock, digging around that? They finally start rocking that rock, pull it out of where it's at, roll it over to the edge where Moses could sit on it. I'm a big guy. I'm six foot six, 200, none of your business pounds. No, about 268 pounds. I'm careful what I sit on. If someone kicks over a cardboard box to me, I'm not sitting on that. I was preaching in New York State. It was the Hudson View Baptist Church. I'll never forget this church for this reason. It was a Filipino church, and boy, they just preached it. No air conditioning in the church. It was July. It was hot. The service lasted like an hour and a half. I remember it was hard to get my tie off. I'd sweat through my shirt. But praise God, afterwards, they had fellowship, which means for Baptist, eating. Amen. 
We were going down the basement, and they had one of my favorite foods. How many of you have ever had lumpia? Oh, it's, it's a Filipino egg roll. You put this red, sweet, hot chili sauce on it. I got down there. I loosened my tie. I'm getting a plate of food. And I saw over there one of those white chairs you buy at Walmart for $5. I went over to that chair. My wife was with me. I sat down in that chair. I did not know the chair had been sitting out in the sun. And plastic sits in the sun. It degrades. That's the excuse I'll make anyway. Soon after sitting on that chair, one of the legs exploded. It sounded like a gun going off. And instantaneously, I collapsed on the floor. My wife, of course, being a mercy giver, said, are you okay? I said, I'm okay. And then she started laughing. So, <laughs> I don't sit on those chairs anymore. Does your pastor, does your administrator still feel comfortable with having you support the ministry? Or has he stopped asking you to do things? Because you've let him down. Are you a renter? Are you an owner? Oh, I know the people. John Getch is five years older than me. But I say, could you cover this while I'm out of town? And he says, yes, I never worry about it again. I told you John Getch is teaching nine classes on campus this term. I never worry. I wonder if Dr. Getch will show up for his class or if he's preaching revival, if he'll have a recorded video for them to watch. John Getch has it. It's done. Be like John Getch. I have people I don't ask. They've disappointed me. They've let me down. Now, Lord bless them. I'm for them. I love them. That's going to reflect back on me. And you reflect back on your administrator, on your pastor. I must hasten. I've got eight minutes to go. I took too long of that. Number two, enlist others to help. I've covered that. Number three, look for ways to be a blessing. Look for ways to be a blessing. I love the statement Jesus went about doing good. I'd like everyone to look up here for just a moment. Who have you been a blessing to in the last week? I'm not asking you to raise your hand or tell me, but I want you to think. Who have you been a blessing to? What widow have you written? What widow have you visited? What shut-in have you called? I just found out my brother, my sister-in-law, and my niece all came down with COVID yesterday. He told me last day, he said, Mark, please pray for me, I've got COVID. He oversees a school of over 1,100. The church said, even coming out of COVID runs over 1,000 on Sunday. You know what I did this morning? I texted him. I said, I prayed for you this morning, Tim. I said, do you mind if I tell Pastor Chapel? He said, yes, but I don't want it to spread. So I'm, I'm telling 125 people, but <laughs> you don't know him. It's all good. You know what I'm going to do at lunch? I'm going to text him, tell him I'm praying for him. It's all I can do from up here. I've already looked on Harry and David. Maybe I could send something to him to encourage him. Some pairs or something like that. If you ask the Holy Spirit who you could encourage, he'll show you. What student have you written a personal note to this week where you said, I've noticed your improvement, or I appreciate your good attitude? We had a girl who weighs about 100 pounds. I didn't even know her name. I thought I knew who she was. She was a freshman. She was playing in the open gym night the other night. She jumped up to do a serve and broke her leg. Her name is Jana. I don't know her last name. I went and bought a milkshake and had a girl take it to the dorm tour. I checked on her yesterday. She said, oh, Dr. R, thanks for checking. I have to have surgery on my leg. I've written her a card. We've had three students the whole year get COVID. I got them a milk, found out they're milkshake. I sent them a card. Maybe you can't even afford to do that, but you can afford to write a note. All right? Jesus went about doing good. I think of Tom Peacock, who I'll probably never see alive again. I'll tell you what I thought about right now. I probably should have visited more. He's blind. He smokes. I hate walking out of a visit where I smell like smoke. But Jesus would have visited him. And I did. But I wish I'd done more. I tried to get our students. I said, my dad passed away a year ago summer. Greatest influence in my life. Best man in my wedding. I wrote him every week of my life from the time I turned 18. And over the last five years, the last years of his life, Every Monday I was in town, I would drive down 84 miles each way, spend an hour, hour and a half with them, and drive home. I asked my wife to teach them a night class, so I'd be doing it, take us three or four hours. 
He's gone now. I'm glad I did. Honestly, I wish I'd done more. I wish I'd done more. We see a situation, if we're an owner, we're going to look for ways to be a blessing. Number four, if we're an owner, we're going to take care of the little things. We're going to take care of the little things. They didn't care about that house. It wasn't theirs. Michelangelo said this. He said, trifles make perfection, and perfection is no trifle. Psalm 16, verse 3, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Take care of the little things. Take care of the little things. Mrs. Horton, who's now in heaven, was an amazing educator. She was a very close friend of my mom, both ladies, both principals. And her last doctorate she gave was to my sister-in-law, Stephanie Rasmussen, because she wanted another lady to get an honorary doctorate, I think. But she taught things like, don't let your kids walk along the wall because they'll rub the paint off. Take care of the plant. Have them walk one foot off the wall when they're walking through the house. That makes good sense. I've walked with her through the campus, and everywhere she's going, she had her little micro cassette recorder. This plant needs watering in the lobby here. This needs to be done there. It was amazing. It was a ministry that she and Arlen Horton had birthed, and she cared about it. My dad told me that back in the 1950s, seeing Bob Jones Sr. run across one of those big expanses of lawn at Bob Jones to pick up a piece of paper that was blowing across the lawn, Bob Jones Sr. He was an owner and not a renter. Get grades back quickly. Get papers back quickly. Did you like waiting two or three weeks to find out what you got on term paper? I didn't. I didn't. Keep parents up to date. Keep up to date. Critical. And number five, be a great server. I'm going to give you a man's name, and I would highly encourage you to read his books. He's dead now. His name is Horst Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-S. He worked for Hilton. He worked for Hyatt. He founded the Ritz-Carlton Hotels. He had some rules for Ritz employees. I'm going to kind of segue these into teaching in the next three minutes. Here's some rules he had for the Ritz-Carlton. And by I've never stayed at Ritz-Carlton. That's out of my league. I have a friend named Todd Starnes, worked for Fox News. He only stays at Ritz-Carlton's. He's not in full-time Christian work. Amen. <laughs> never stayed in one. Someday I hope to take my wife there and use points. But it's part of the Marriott family now. Get this. Here's his rules. If you work in the office, answer the phone within three rings. That's an owner, not a renter. Number two, identify and immediately correct mistakes. Identify and immediately correct mistakes. Number three, assist others. Assist others. Number four, boy, this is so big for Christmas schools. And I, I'm in 100 churches a year on average, usually 75 the summer. I'll leave the Saturday for Thanksgiving. I'm preaching in 20-some churches in Texas. I'm in a lot of places. I appreciate when the places are neat and clean. Because so many aren't. They only are not because people do not care. Ensure all areas are immaculate. We expect that at a Ritz-Carlton, not that I've ever stayed there. But how about the house of God? Number five, always acknowledge the student even if it interrupts you. I have, and Dr. Getch has an open door policy. If someone comes to see me, I will stop whatever I'm doing to help a student because they are the ones that I am there for. I do a lot of writing, I don't write a lot of messages or lectures in the afternoons because students are coming. They're the reason you're there. Maybe Rick Covey said, man, it's amazing how much I got done when the students weren't here. <laughs> students aren't there, we don't have a school. Stop whatever you're doing to help them. Own problems, apologize, and resolve. Own problems, apologize, and resolve. I'll tell you an interesting story I learned in reading this book by Horst Schultze. Any Ritz employee, I'm talking a first-year employee at the desk, could spend up to $2,000 to make a customer happy. Here's the story that illustrates this. 
a business that was staying in the Ritz-Carlton in Atlanta, he left early that morning, caught a flight to fly to Hawaii for a very important meeting. When he got to Hawaii, he realized he had left his laptop with his business presentation in the room. Now, I think he'd be going the extra mile if you took it to FedEx and tried to pay for the next day, but the lady said, he said, I've got to get this. My presentation's on there. The desk manager got the laptop, went to the airport, bought a flight, went to Hawaii, gave it to him at the airport. She was given a bonus by Horst Schultze. I wonder how many people that man told about the service of the Ritz-Carlton. So what will the parents in your class say about your service in the year that you had their child? Go the extra mile, go the second mile, we talked about that. Give them your complete attention and focus. I know it's good to multitask, but not when you're talking to someone else. I turn my computer screen off and put my phone face down. Say, what if it's Pastor Chapel's utter emergency? He knows where I am, he'll send someone to get me. Trust me, he's done that before. And if my thing is, I hear the buzz, yeah, I put it on silent anyway, I hear those texts coming in, I'll check it as soon as I'm done. But there is a phrase in the Bible that says this, this one thing I do, not these many things I dabble at, this one thing I do. My wife corrected me on that. I was leading a man to Christ. I got a text and I answered it. She goes, really, Mark? You know who it is, man's in heaven today. You know what I thought? She was right, I was wrong. And it was someone who worked for me at the college, it was important, but it wasn't as important as what I was doing right then. Those students need to have our attention very quickly. Know your subject. He said, know your product. Be positive and gracious. Remember, slow to wrath, long-suffering, patient, kind are all Bible words. Bible words. Take time to show them, don't just tell them. At the Ritz-Carlton, you're never allowed to tell someone where to go. You have to take them to that place or get them within sight of it. I was in Costco. We have this Chinese boy, Steve, living with us. He eats noodles. I've never bought noodles, all right? They come, I don't know what kind, I don't even know what the name is, but it's something Chinese. I didn't know where they're at in Costco. I know where the sourdough bread is, amen, all right? So I'm looking for, I asked the first guy, where are the noodles? He goes, ah, they're over there, somewhere between 202 and 208. True story, those are the aisles. You know how long the aisles are in Costco? <laughs> so I went to another one. Yeah, it's over there, I think it's over there by the two, 200s. Great help. Renters, renters. Then I asked a lady, her name was Marilyn. I said, I'm trying to find these noodles. Here's a picture of it. She said, here, I'll show you where they're at. She took me there. I bought a case of noodles or two cases of noodles. I went back, I found a manager. I said, sir, I want to tell you something about my experience today. I didn't know the names of the first two people. I said, these two people just told me what to do. I said, Marilyn took me there. I said, you got to do something for Marilyn. I said, that's how they do it at the Ritz-Carlton. He said, yeah, we need to get our other people to do that. And we need to, certainly need to do that in Christian work. Don't tell them, show them. Right? Don't tell them, show them. My time is up. I'm giving a closing illustration. That's, that's for the hotel business. By the way, if it's important for the Ritz-Carlton, how much more so for your church? At Faith Baptist Church in Spokane. They're in Tigard. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying? Quick, quick pictures here, and we'll, we'll be done. How many baseball players, how many folks have heard of Shohei Otani? If you know sports at all. He's this incredible black albatross, unbelievable player. He throws the ball 100 miles an hour, and he hit 44 home runs last year. It's never been done before. MVP in the American League this year. He plays for the California Angels. He throws the ball so fast, he hits the ball so far, he's one of the fastest runners in baseball. He's from Japan, he doesn't speak English. He has an interpreter, goes with him everywhere he goes. This is a video of him running to first base. You make that video go? Oh. On the ball field, he stops and picks up a piece of trash and puts it in his pocket. He's a multi-gazillionaire. He's an owner, he's not a renter. I have another video of him, he's walking through the dugout. Baseball dugouts are like ghettos. They spit on the floor, their peanut shells on the floor. He's walking through the ghetto, through the ghetto dugout of the California Angels. He picks up three pieces of paper, walks down, and puts it in the trash can. That was on ESPN. 
I have another, don't put up the next slide yet. There's a man who's German. I just saw this a few weeks ago. He's a Formula One racer. Formula One racers make a lot of money. In fact, this man's salary, he's employed by the Ferrari car team. He has $40 million a year. His name is Sebastian Vettel. In the British Grand Prix, remember England, England and Germany don't have a great history of getting along together. He had to retire from the race after 40 laps. Now, could you imagine the suite he had wherever he was staying? He'd been there all day, sweat, hottie, wearing a fire suit. I think I would go take that suit off, go take a shower and go take a nap. He's out of the race. But his sport was important to him. This is a picture of Sebastian Vettel, salary $40 million after the race. That's him. Going through the grandstands, picking up trash. He's an owner and not a renter. I ask you, my friends, will you be an owner of the place God has given you? Lord, I pray you bless each and every one of us and help me, Lord, not just teach this, but to live it. We love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the privilege that is ours to serve you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.